Greetings, and welcome to the very clean Beatles Stuffology, where two old friends sit around and talk BS, Beatles stuff, on a track-by-track -track basis, pretty much for the sake of it. My name is JG McCrory, and I'm here with my co-host, Andrew Deacon. Say hi, Andrew. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> Just pausing for effect. I realise that I've <laughs> started actually answering that in the last few episodes, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually conflicted, um, and some of which you'll see as we... we you know, go through the episode, but I'm I'm also conflicted because despite having listened to quite a lot of Beatles music in the last week or so, I cannot for the life of me get a completely different song out of my head at the moment, and that is the absolute stone cold classic that is Madness Night Boat to Cairo. It's it's just there, it's in my head, and I can't get rid of it. Well, I don't know if I can really do much to help you with that, although I do agree that it's a stone cold classic, so you're not going to get any argument from me on that front. What a great time. Absolutely. And I, I tell you, what, I, it sort of fits in with, you know, one of the things that I mentioned on here is that I like songs that have distinct change in tempo. And that really, really works on that. But also, I, I suppose, you know, if you think about it, you could probably draw a line. Let, let's let's try and make this sound professional. You could probably draw a line between the uh, um, the Beatles and uh, and Madness, not least in their approach towards humour which is maybe, funny enough, something that we'll, we'll touch on today, because I think with the, um, um, the song that we're going to talk about today, I think you have to delve into some aspect of um, the, the, the comedy influence on the Beatles. Right, that has teed it up for you, Mr. Host. Right, well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Co-host. Um, uh, excellent attempt at appearing professional. So, two things. Um, firstly, yes, that all sounds very credible, and I'm impressed that you've managed to draw that line on the fly. So, excellent work there all round. Good. I knew there was a reason we started doing this together. Um, but secondly, uh, <laughs> it's it's obviously we have to get over the, uh, the initial kind of introductory stuff. So, we are starting a new album, which means we are diving into A Hard Day's Night, and it means we're dealing with the title track, A Hard Day's Night, um, so we're all, I was going to say we're all hard all the time, but I'm not going to say that after all. I, I think uh, I think I should find another way to uh, to do that introduction. But anyway, um, how are you finding this song? Well, I think we ought to um, also at this point point out a flaw in, in us doing this song because we, we did have some discussion because technically we, did. We, did. we should be doing Can't Buy Me Love because uh, you know, uh, we're looking at the release in order um then dear listener you you should appreciate the fact that we did have a conversation about whether we were going to do can't buy me love because obviously that is the next beatles release after i want to hold your hand and a massive massive seller um so much more than um um hard day's night as a single actually it's huge one of the, the the six Beatles songs that sold more than than a million singles however we decided that because it's on the album as is the B-side for Can't Buy Me Love, that we would wait until um, we got onto um, the album itself. So we've moved on, and technically we're starting both the album and the next single, which is um, A Hard Day's Night. And I think it's fair to say that that um, I don't exactly have a hot take on it, not that I particularly like the expression hot take, but I'm not quite in love with it as much as I think I'm probably meant to be. And I don't know whether that's just from familiarity. And it's a weird thing as well, because, you know, we've been talking about um, the, the first two albums. And actually, the first two albums are quite similar in, in a lot of way. There's, there's sort of gradual improvement in, in some of the songs. But there's a lot from the first album that's the same on the second. Now we start getting into a point where there is a huge increase in quality Beatles for sale notwithstanding and you know and it's going to be really dramatic over the next couple of years and yet I think because I know this song so well I think I'm just a bit kind of maybe at the point where I know it too well and it's just a bit too familiar I can't quite listen to it in uh, in the same way as perhaps Recently, I was listening to This Boy, which I'd probably not heard more than about, you know, once or twice in my life before we then, you know, did the deep dive on it. Whereas I probably heard A Hard Day's Night, you know, I'm going to exaggerate for effect, you know, several billion times. But, you know, you sort of see it's, it's one of those songs that's kind of been ever present 
um and so it's 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 great i know it's great i'm just a little jaded towards it i don't think that's difficult to understand it is one of the big problems when you come to tackling a, a subject like the beatles is that there is so much material that you have read and absorbed mm-hmm. and watched and listened to and there is so many times that you have heard these albums over the uh, preceding half century or so that it is very difficult to come to it fresh and it was one of the nice things about the episode we did on I Want to Hold Your Hand another song which I think it would be very easy to be jaded on and kind of a bit kind of like well you know how often do you need to hear this song before you go yeah it's great um, which it is but I kind of I do appreciate one of the reasons I do appreciate doing this podcast is that it does mean that you can come to the material fresh and pay attention to it and listen to it rather than it just being you know kind of like omnipresent pop culture background mm-hmm. radiation um having said all that i slightly agree with you as well um i think all of the impressive bits of this song which are the opening chord of course um ringo who's phenomenal uh on this track george's guitar solo um i think those are the three standouts uh and maybe the arpeggiated outro um but they're all great and normally with a song by the Beatles, I mean, their great talent is, is, is you know, the whole is more than the sum of the, the, the parts. Whereas there's something slightly about Hard Day's Night, the song, it's just the parts. And the parts are all very good, but it doesn't quite have that same, like, you can, again, to, to take uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand as the example, that song is definitely more than the sum of the parts. Um, and this one just slightly isn't. I think there's okay. So I disagree with you about the the George Harrison guitar solo. I think he's really struggling for one here. I, I think it's it's you know we'll, we'll gloss over. I, I I would rather gloss over it because I, I don't think it's worth a hill of beans um, compared to you know other work. But I actually think that I want to hold your hand when you go back and listen to it. it has a freshness and a lightness to it, uh, which just sheer joy. There's something about this that is impressive in terms of the songwriting. Yeah, it's great in terms of the performance. And yet it still feels slightly, for the Beatles, workaday. And and I think one of the things that I, I find difficult to distinguish, um, or, or, well, I suppose difficult to distinguish, yeah, I mean, there's this run of singles coming up, particularly Lennon tracks, where we've got, um, you know, Hard Day's Night, Ticket to Ride, I feel fine, day tripper, help. And actually, for me at the moment, they kind of all meld into one. I know they're different, um, you know, the sort of different styles and rhythms and all of that, but actually I find it quite hard to separate all of them out in the same way as we'll be able to separate out um, some of the, the later singles, for example. And it, And it's actually quite interesting that what I've not done is I've not included, um, you know, the the McCartney A sides in that with you know can't buy me love and we can work it out. It doesn't mean I think they're better songs. It, it's just that these ones just feel very. Oh, I don't want to say say me because I know that's that's you know far too damning. But they do feel quite similar. Okay, that's interesting. In fact, just yeah. just to. Just, can I, can I just follow that up? I, I did spend, you know, about half an hour um, uh, at this point doing um, some research before I realised I'd, I'd been researching Ticket to Ride. Um, <laughs> and, and we weren't doing that yet. So I'm very prepared for that episode when we eventually get to it. Good uh, good, good to know. I've, I've recently learned the Ticket to Ride riff on guitar and it's a massive pain and it greatly in, increased my appreciation of that song. So that'll be an interesting conversation to have when we get there. But we're <laughs> not talking about that one just yet. Um, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting song in that in the, it, it, it does feel... I mean, everything about this album feels like a development on. I don't think there's any question about that from, from With The Beatles. Yeah. And... The quality yeah. of the songs here, I think, is I would also argue, is is unquestionably better than the last album. Everything is better than the last album on this one. Um, yeah. What's odd about Hard Day's Night is that um, we've been, we've talked about sequencing before, and I have a feeling that opening the album with this, I, it's it's almost certainly unavoidable. It, of course, it's the title track to the movie. What else are you gonna? open this album with what else are you going to call this album it it is completely inescapable but 
I think if you put that to one side, I'm not convinced it's a perfect album opener. Um, and I think that's the thing. A lot of the other material on this album, um, I think, is stronger than A Hard Day's Night. Not that I think Hard Day's Night is a bad song. I absolutely don't, of course. Um, but there's so much here which I think is stronger. Things We Said Today, I'll Cry Instead, Can't Buy Me Love. There's a lot here. Um, and I think that's the thing. When you're, when you're listening to this kind of material, in order and in context in this way sometimes those big sellers can come across as a little bit um you use the word work today i don't want to i don't want to just repeat that but but there is a there's a functionality to this song it, it is there to fulfill a function and it fulfills that function perfectly adequate and buggers off again and that's fine but it's not really remarkable in the same way that even I think um, Can't Buy Me Love is a, a much more remarkable song than, than Hard Day's Night. It, it, it does its job. It's definitely it's definitely a song which is the opener of an album and definitely the, uh, you know, the 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 title track from the movie. Slightly is. But then are you are you still in a position where you, you haven't seen the film? No, no, I have seen the film. Of course I have. OK. Um, because the only reason that it opens the album is because it opens the film. Yeah, of course. That's that's it. It's, it's a, I mean, it's as much a the first half anyway, a soundtrack, as it is um, um, a Beatles album. So you know, and the same thing happens um, on Help as well. So yeah, um, you know, the so we're kind of getting the point where the sequencing um, isn't necessarily theirs, but but sort of related to the fact it's a soundtrack. And and if you want to then sort of carry that on, um, obviously at the end of side one, you've got Can't Buy Me Love. Um, and at the end of side one of, of Help, you've got Ticket to Ride. So there's there's that kind of sort of similarity in terms of what they're doing there. And of course, remember that the side two of this album, we're going, we're going early on, on the album chat, and, and not songs that were on the soundtrack. They were songs that were written at the, the same time as well so it's you know they, they've kind of pushed everything together on on side one and and it, and it's worth then kind of linking in with why this song exists in the first place and it's purely because having recorded a bunch of songs um they were then told that they needed something that that used the um the title of the film you know john lennon goes away 24 hours later he comes back with um um, you know, with his, and, and this is where it's difficult to talk about this without talking about Can't Buy Me Love, you know, with McCartney having had a super smash with Can't Buy Me Love, Lennon is determined that it's going to be, what am I talking about him in the present tense? Um, Lennon was determined what do you know? that he is, is going to write the next one. So, okay, right, sorry, well done, Paul, but, you know, this one's going to be mine. 24 hours later, back he comes, song done, absolutely fantastic great let's let's put it out you know so um it, it it's just, it's it sort of sits in that weird position where it comes you know quite late on um in the process and i think maybe that's when, when we get on to talking about the song itself there's there's something in that again which which i think i've noticed more um you know the more i listen to it that, that might be why i'm not perhaps quite so taken so you know there's there's things that we need to bear in mind um so you know it was recorded you know at the end of the main sessions for the album they only did nine takes on the 16th of april you know it was written recorded you know, in a hurry the filming um started on the 2nd of march and it ended on the 24th of april so if you want to i mean that's such an amazing thing yeah, yeah. that um there's only two months of, of filming and they're recording the title song with just over a week before, um, um, you know, shooting is, is due to end. People, you know, it's, people don't make films like that, um, <laughs> you know, understandably anymore. And it's, it's a crazy way to go about it. But then it's a crazy thing that, that it was written and recorded and, um, and then, you know, the film we finished and then the film released in the space of just a handful of months. And just to give you an indication of how crazy their schedule was, you know, having um, recorded Hard Day's Night on the 16th of April, bearing in mind they're also filming, they spend two days um, rehearsing and recording the music for their ITV show around the Beatles on the 18th and 19th of April. What is going on? You know, Brian Epstein's got them working like a dog. 
Oh, excellent. Very, oh, very you. smooth indeed. <laughs> excellent, excellent work. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously the schedule is absolutely punishing. And I do agree with what, just to sort of link back to something you started um, saying there, um, I do agree with what you're talking about in terms of the, the functionality of the album as well and the fact that obviously half of it's a soundtrack, half of it's just songs, um, which is why when I was talking about the placement of this at the start, I said, you know, you if you could put all that to one side, I know you can't, but if you could, uh, in a, in a fantasy world, um, and I think that 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 slightly shows up the oh, pos- positive is far too strong a word, right? It, but it does sh- maybe show up the song slight shortcomings. Mm-hmm. Do you think then that the speed in which this was uh, written and recorded contributes to that feeling that it isn't quite as much, you know, the whole isn't as much some of the parts. Uh, in the way yeah, that other songs are, I think so because I, I think the the baseline is feels very straightforward on this. Like McCartney really hasn't had time to work. Yeah, there's no flourishes else. at all. No, and and it's very much driven by by the rhythm guitar as well. You know, there's a you can hear a lot of of um, you know that that sort of rhythm to it as well, which kind of takes away from some of the the subtlety that you might have heard in some of the the other songs when you you take them apart and and again it feels like i'm i'm being overly critical it's it's you know it's still really really good it's just yeah you just not yeah, I get quite it. I get it. there <laughs> Yeah, and it's a yeah. funny old uh, it's a funny old time in the charts when this one gets to number one as well, because it's it's one of those songs where its 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 status uh, as going to number one was pretty much, you know, it, it was never not going to number yeah. one. Let's let's say it that way. But it's also it's getting to the point where the charts themselves are starting to get an awful lot more interesting. We've talked about the charts a few times in the podcast, and there's definitely a sense of which a lot of 1963 feels like a hangover from 1957 or 1958. That's really starting to change now as well. The, the competition in, in the charts when this is released, it's 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 not Acker, Bilk and, and Cliff anymore. It's, you know, uh, I mean, this, this song knocked the Rolling Stones off number one with It's All Over Now, um, when the song got to number one, um, the animals are at number five with their other song, House of the Rising Sun, um, and it had been it had been a number one as well. Um, so things are really starting to look an awful lot more sort of interesting and a lot more varied as well in terms of the charts. Dusty's in there. There is a Cliff song in there, um, but it, it's it's Cliff, Roy Orbison, Elvis. I mean, there's some of the old beasts are still yeah, but uh, you've still got around. but you've got the Searchers, you've got the Swinging Blue Jeans, you've got the Tremlos, um, and, the and yeah, and and at number twenty you've got the Beach Boys. So you know the the. And, you know, their their arrival is also something of a bellwether as well. You know, that stuff is going to hang around. You know, people like Cliff, you know, he's still having bloody hits. He's not, certainly not going to stop at 1964. Um, yeah. but, but, the, but the remarkable nature of them has long, long passed. It's something we, we've kind of um, spoken about before is those sort of waves of entertainment. And, and you know, when the Beatles first started getting into the charts, yes, you're right, the Akabilks and, and the Cliffs reign supreme. But of course, then with the Beatles come in some of those other, if you like, B groups. And actually the first wave of those are really on the way out now. So, you know, further down the charts, you know, you've got um, the Dave Clark Five who managed to have another top 10 hit, but it's not, you know, bits and pieces or, or glad all over. You know, there probably aren't that many people around who can hum, can't you see that she's mine? <laughs> you, you can know, include I, me I, in that I number. Love glad all over. I think Glad All Over is, is an amazing track, but I don't think I've ever heard that one. Um, so, yeah, so we, we, we're sort of seeing another wave of, of beat groups come up with people like, um, you know, the the animals. And, and later this year, we'll start to get others coming in like the Kinks. And then in 65, we'll start to get the Who as well. So, yeah, the competition um, will really pick up. And and that will contribute to the fact that the Beatles will start to spend an awful lot less time at number one. Um, that doesn't diminish the the achievement because they've effectively heralded that achievement. Yeah, no, absolutely, it doesn't. And you know, but it is interesting that you know, for all that this song gets to number one, it doesn't stay there as long as you might 
um, as long as you might imagine, given that it's it's 1964. I suppose we have to sort of mention the the inevitable thing about um, this song being the first song, which was simultaneously at number one in the UK and the US, and also the album as well, um, which is is nice, but it's also just kind of a historical footnote. It, it, it doesn't feel like that particularly... Um, it feels like a logical conclusion of everything that this has been building up to, let's say it that way, rather than something which, you know, um, which feels like it, it, it was uh, a massive achievement in its own right, which, of course, it is. It's going to be almost, uh, almost, <laughs> almost, yeah. yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't want to undersell just what an achievement it is. That's not going to happen again okay. until 1970. So it's going to take seven years before any other act uh, manages to achieve that. And that's Simon and Garfunkel. Um, but nevertheless, it, it just it feels it feels like an apropos conclusion. Let's say it that way. Yeah, and and I wonder if this is this this conversation we're having is is kind of like the the hangover after I want to hold your hand and and the you know the bombarding cultural impact um, that 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 had um, yeah you know, kind of makes it difficult to get as excited about this when actually it's still you know top notch songwriting and and yet because it's not i want to hold your hand and because it's not say you know penny lane or hey jude or um you know i could sort of list a few personal favorites off say you know revolver at that point um yeah it doesn't quite excite but again i think that's its ubiquity um well and you can't maintain you can't maintain that sort of peak of excitement indefinitely at some point that has to fall back and that's that's the thing if we take something like um i want to hold your hand as as kind of the peak of that and i think from the episode that we we did on it i think that's a fair conclusion um but you can't yeah you can't maintain that indefinitely nobody can of course not so of course at some point there's going to be a a falling back and and if that's what um if that's what this is, then, you know, <laughs> to have that as be your fallback position. I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world, is it? I do wonder if we'd have gone ahead and recorded um, um, Can't Buy Me Love and You Can't Do That, whether or not we would be talking about those songs in the same way and therefore get to um, um, Hard Day. I nearly said Ticket to Ride there. Get to Hard Day Tonight. <laughs> And then suddenly it would be this explosion of enthusiasm and hey, it's fantastic and da 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 and da 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 and da da da. But um, it, we may be kind of hoist by our own petard. Um, while we're, we're we're sort of talking about things like the charts, of course, it's it's worth pointing out that there are precedents for you know um, the pop singer and the um, and the film. Obviously, two of them in the chart at the time in terms of Cliff and Elvis and you can sort of see why it would be a logical route uh, to follow in terms of advertising especially as you know cinema um, you know being such an amazing I mean certainly if you sort of look you know 40s into the 50s we are starting to see a slight decline in terms of ticket sales but still it was such an important thing going on in people's lives while people didn't have as much access to say for example television um, you know, it was it was the social um, event, really. So um, you can sort of see why it's a logical thing for them to do. But what I find interesting is, and, and we will do an episode where we, we talk about the film, but I think it's interesting that the, the film was conceived before they had the success in America. And then they started um, um, filming just after they'd had the, their first massive success in America. But they kept the decision to keep it very kind of low key um, and stick to the budget, stick to the, you know, black and white, stick to this, you know, very um, cute, slightly eccentric sitcom-esque story um, and not to go for something much bigger, which they did on Help. So, you know, I mean, there's there's a bit of credit that goes there with that, but they kept their original um, sense of um, ambition. Well, yeah, and the... Uh whole thing about the uh, hard day oh, by the way incidentally a great job in burying the lead there we will be doing an episode which is exclusively about a hard day's night the movie as well as the album you you, you let that one drift through what you were saying but i just want to make that that yeah, slightly yeah. more explicit um but yeah i mean the other thing is of course is that they you know um one of the great joys of um the shared experiences that the beatles had together was comedy it was, you know, we've mentioned it before, mm. but it was The Goons. It was, you know, The Navy Lark. It was all these kind of shows that had, you know, largely been produced by George Martin. Um, and, you know, there was loads of 
um, you know, loads of history that the band had with that sense of humor and, and sticking with it is, is, you know, probably only, only logical. And there is a real charm to the movie, which is, is completely infectious in a way that almost none of the sort of contemporary movies are. I mean, regardless of what your one's feeling towards say Cliff Richard is like those films are not good they're just not and and most of elvis's films are rubbish as well um and you know there's uh, there's plenty of other artists who've, who've who've made movies it, it it was a thing uh god david essex was still doing it in the 1970s um you know it continue it continues to be Slade. a thing yeah oh, yeah let's it's <laughs> a conversation for another the, um, day AB, did you ever see the abc film and it's circa 1983 as well no. that's, that's, that's called mad trap Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's 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 fun. Directed by Julian Temple. Oh, lovely, lovely. No, I can't say I've ever seen that one. I'll yeah, um... it's, yeah it still doesn't mean it's any good. So, um, okay, right. But so, anyway, but the but I, the I point I was what... trying to make was basically most of those movies are rubbish in a way that that A Hard Day's Night isn't. Um, and it is that it is that sticking to their own their own thing which makes that movie better. Yeah. So there's there's two things uh, <laughs> about this song that. How, I'm, how many I'm, other I'm things would there be? No, it's fine. It's fine. I'm sticking on theme here. There's a couple of things about this song that I'm not particularly interested in, but everybody else seems to be interested in. I'm not really interested in any of the stories about um, the, how the song title was come up with. You know, whatever order it is. It's a little bit like the, the various stories about I Want to Be Your Man and how the Stones ended up recording it. Um, and... I'm not really interested um, in the opening chord. It's not my thing. I like the opening chord. You know, all this discussion about when well, it's this laid with this and then it's this and that and the other. I oh, know, but it might be this or this. Great, whatever. You, you, you have your discussions. You crack on with that. And I'll just go, yeah, that's quite good. And then we get into the jugga, jugga, jugga that follows. However, the only thing I know will sort of say in relation to um, the title of the song is that it does connect incredibly well um, with the goons. And you find this a lot with um, with Lennon's humour. Um, I know that, you know, it was an expression that, that Ringo came up with. However, it's, um, um, yeah, Lennon appropriated it already before um, it came up as the song type. So, you know, in, in his own right, there is a story called Sad Michael, which uh, he uses it. But um, the the story itself is has the perfect summary of that that goons type humour, where you you might perhaps do something very absurd and change a word so that it sounds a little bit similar to the word it's meant to be, but then actually it's in a slightly comic way. Now I realise that that that's a gross simplification of Spike Milligan's humour. Um, but I mean, it's it's worth if you if you just sort of um, you know bear with me for a second. I'm just going to read the story of Sad Michael. Okay, yeah, are you sitting comfortably? It. Very comfortably. Then I'll begin. There's one for the teenagers. There was no reason for Michael to be sad that morning. The little wretch. Everyone liked him. The scab. He'd had a hard day's night that day. For Michael was a cocky watchtower. His wife, Bernie, who was well controlled, had rabbed his Norman lunch, but he was still sad. It was strange for a man whom hath everything and a wife to boot. At four o'clock, when his fire was burking brightly, a police man had clubbed in to pass the time around P-A-R-S-E. Good even, Michael, the police man speak. But Michael did not answer, for he was deb and duff and could not speak. How's the wife? Michael spoke the policeman. Shut up about that. I thought you were Deb and Duff and could not speak, said the policeman. Now, what am I going to do with all my Deb and Duff books, said Michael, realising straight away that here was a problem to be reckoned with. Lovely. Thank you for that. So, you know, the whole Deb and Duff, deaf and dumb, see what you've done there, speak for speak. Police man for policeman, you know Norman lunch, normal lunch. You know you can see what he's doing there. Um, you know pass for pass. Oh God, it, it's you know without 
Spike Milligan and Peter Sellers and Harry Seacombe to actually put it into life. It's, you know, it's it's quite interesting. It's quite juvenile in terms of the humour. And you almost wonder if that sort of fits in, hey, psychology fans, with quite a few aspects of John Lennon. I'm sure if, if we would sort of sit down and have that long conversation about his childhood and the whole, um, you know, separated from his mother, mother dying, Aunt Mimi's influence and blah, 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 you probably would find that, you know, you could come up with some theory about arrested development. And I think that that sort of um, goes along with it. And so it's clearly a phrase that he liked um, for its its nonsense value. But I think from my point of view, the fact that it has a nonsense, almost empty value kind of goes along with sort of how I feel about the song. Brilliant, but it just leaves me a bit empty. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, this is slightly off topic, I guess, but I think that is the thing about a lot of uh, a lot of Lennon's written work is that it does have that slight aspect of um, juvenilia that he never quite develops beyond. Like, a, a, a Spaniard yeah. in the Works is basically just in his own right, Mark II. It's exactly the same sense of humour and exactly the same kind of wordplay. And there is clearly... Um, you know, a lot of thought that's gone into it. But what seems incredibly clever when you're sort of scribbling it down with your mate when you're 14 yeah. doesn't necessarily yeah. uh, still manage to work. And like you say, without the kind of performances of, of people who really know how to imbue that material with with the, the kind of creative crackle and energy that it needs, your, your Spike Milligans and your Peter Sellers, yeah. it just doesn't quite come together. It's And that's not really i mean like like someone isn't as funny as peter sellers or spike milligan that's <laughs> i mean that's not an insult it's like saying well somebody's not as good a songwriter as john lennon and paul mccartney i mean you know it's it, it's the same it's the same neck of the woods um but nevertheless he's not so before we move on and actually talk about the song itself <laughs> do you know the other um big links between the goons and the beatles you, you mean george martin that's one of them yeah. So, yeah, George Martin being um, uh, the producer of uh, Peter Sellers uh, records, for example, he did quite a few comedy records, um, you know, produced such records as uh, Songs for Swinging Sellers. But so that was an album, which is a good joke. Um, Balham Gateway to the South, which is a fairly good joke. And Goodness Gracious Me, which is a fairly racist joke. Um, but, you know, there was that involvement and that was one of the things that endeared the Beatles to him, the fact that they shared that sense of humour. Uh, the other one is um, uh, goes by the name of Dick Lester, um, because did you know, fans, Dick Lester, when The Goon Show was um, translated for television, um, I don't think you can actually see any of the episodes anymore, and I don't really think it worked. Um, it was directed by uh, Richard Lester of Hard Day's Night fame. There you go. I did not know that. Thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. I, so that was the telegoons you're talking about then? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, okay. it was something called a show called Fred. So I don't think that was the telegoons. The telegoons was puppets, wasn't it? Then they used sort of... Um, uh, anyway. That, I, that, like well, I say, well that's, that's why I'm asking, because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of the difference. So. No. No. Well, I, the, bearing in mind that they're, they're things that you can't really see anymore, it's, it's kind of hard to find out. Because um, there's also something else that says that um, it was actually called the Idiot Weekly Two Pence. Um, and then a show called Fred and Son of Fred. Anyway, so he was involved in in all of those in in the um, the mid fifties. Um, but I think the Telegoons may have been something different again. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I'm I'm not. I like, I like the Goons. I'm not a massive Goon head or anything. So I, I'm I'm a bit vague on on, on these things. Um, and we should probably talk about the song now, right? Um, yeah, if you want to. I mean, we can come back to Peter Sellers when we come on to um, cover versions. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, let's let's talk about the song. Do you wanna do you wanna sort of get involved in talking about that opening chord and I'll take a break for a couple of minutes, go on Twitter and uh maybe check WhatsApp and yeah, you you do your muso stuff and, and I'll be back when you uh you give me a shout. All right, oh, no problem at all. I will happily take over the reins here. Oh, when it comes to that opening chord, I don't give a fuck. Um <laughs> 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 I mean like it sounds great, uh, uh, but I think possibly the uh the level to which it has been uh, exaggerated in popular culture might just be slightly more than one chord can sustain, if you'll excuse the terrible pun. 
Um, it's not, uh, yeah, it's uh, like great. It's it's a great opening card. It's a great crashing open to the album and the movie. Um, fine, that's. I don't really have anything else to say about it. Um, yeah. Um, oh, okay, that's that's disappointing. I thought yeah. you could keep us going for a few minutes. No, not really. And the thing is, the rest of the song isn't very complicated. Like, there's so many arguments about precisely what that opening chord is and i i don't know like you know you you obviously you know i i play but when people start talking about like um d minor 7 sustained fourths like, i kind of lose the will to live i that's really not that's not my not my kind of thing and the rest of the song beyond that um opening chord is not a massively complicated piece it's g c f d b minor e minor it's all it's all very simple chords kind of strung together. That makes perfect sense because it's been written in a tremendous hurry and the logic is that, you know, it's 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 simple, it's fast, it's done, move on. I mean, that's I can't really argue with that, but yeah, it's it's not a complicated song uh, by any stretch of the imagination and the, the the only two things that stand stand out in terms of the 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 guitars uh, are the the well the opening chord I suppose the arpeggiated conclusion um and and george's guitar solo well you've made your opinions clear on george's guitar solo they're not ones that i completely agree with i i i think it sounds phenomenal um but the, yeah that that closing that closing arpeggiated guitar is just lovely it's such a gorgeous sound um and here concludes the musical part of this podcast i think it's um I, I suppose it's, it's always good that different people can get different things from a song. If we all agreed, then then you know life would probably be an awful lot more boring. Um, you know, I like the um, the singing on the middle eight, for example. I think you know Lennon does a you know perfectly good job, um, but I think McCartney shines on on the middle eights um, here. I, I think that's that's a really fantastic part, and I think it's interesting that. That Lennon said, "Well, I tell you what, you you sing this. It sort of suits your range a bit better uh, than mine." Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that lifts it for me. But I also think that during the the, the mid late, um, you actually have what is definitively the best part of this song. And I will brook no argument on this. And that is the wonderful addition of the cowbell. I thought you were anti cowbell. You know, no cowbell. I mean, it, it's just just stunning. That monotone, um, you know, bashing is is just absolutely just transcendent. I love that to bits. It's possibly my favourite piece of of uh, um, quote unquote drumming uh, on in the entire Beatles catalogue. Excellent. Well, I'm very very pleased to hear you say nice things about Cowbell. I love a Cowbell. Me and you don't have to sell me on it because I completely agree. I do. Yeah. Th- but it's funny. It is such a small thing, but it adds so much energy and kind of drive to that that middle eight. I mean, uh, really not being facetious about that. I, th- I think the Cowbell is phenomenal, and it really does push that into uh, you know a, d- a different space. Also, talking about the middle eight, since we're on the subject, it is also worth listening to. Uh, live performances of this uh, song. There's one on YouTube particularly um, where um, like McCartney starts kind of doing his rock voice on it, um, particularly mm-hmm. right at the end, the, the sort of feeling you're holding me tight and then it kind of goes into the ah! and uh, it, it sounds phenomenal, like McCartney really knocks it out of the park and I kind of wish he had done that on the recorded version a little bit more again I suspect that's probably just a a function of the fact that it was done so quickly um but when he's playing it live and he kind of pushes that into his kind of i'm down voice his kind of um sort of mm-hmm. little richard range it just sounds great and it does give that song a push because it, it gives a slightly um a slightly stronger contrast between lennon and mccartney's voice it's a really really lovely thing so it's well well worth having a listen to the the live versions of this song as well for that it's an odd thing this song isn't it because there isn't really a chorus you, you kind of get uh, a section at the end of the verse where it sort of comes to a, a conclusion, but there isn't anything that, that has a real hook to it in, in a, that sort of traditional sense. Yeah, no, there, there, there's, this is, the song doesn't have a chorus. It's another thing that distinguishes it from uh, from a lot of the kind of big hits of the time. Uh, but yeah, yeah the, absolutely, mm. yeah, there's no chorus in the song. And I think that's maybe why 
I can see those similarities to um, Ticket to Ride and I Feel Fine, for example, because certainly as I run through them in my head, it feels quite similar in terms of the construction. Yeah, no, no, structurally, they're very, very similar indeed. And they also, uh, yeah, both those songs issue a traditional chorus. Um, and sort of going back to it, like, I Want to Hold Your Hand doesn't really have a chorus either. But the but but just the repeat of, that, of those two lines, I Want to Hold Your Hand, I Want to Hold Your Hand, functions as a sort of chorus. Um, whereas, uh, yeah, you're right, no, um, uh, mm-hmm. neither Day Tripper nor uh, I Feel Fine have have choruses of of any sort and structurally they're very very similar to to this uh to the song the the positioning of the guitar solo is also quite interesting because it i mean it could potentially break the rhythm but um you know it doesn't it, it, it's sort of what i mean i don't particularly think it's this you know even in the the, the top flight of his of his best work but you know in, in terms of where they put it, it seems to work really, really well. It almost, for me, comes in a place where you wouldn't expect it, um, but it's all the better for it. It sort of breaks up the the rhythm in a way that, that at least helps to develop the song. Well, that's the thing. I think one of the reasons that I think Harrison's work is great on this song is that because it's because that solo sounds like George Harrison's solo. It doesn't sound like he's doing an impression of like Chet Atkins or someone. It sounds like him. And I think that's kind of the shift on from from the last album. Um, and a lot of that kind of fast finger work, the dee lee lee all that stuff, is that's, that's, that's not him just turning up and like knocking out a solo when he's not really paying attention. He's putting the work in in this one. And I think that's what really elevates it. I do agree with you in terms of its uh, positioning in the song. But again, and I know we do say this quite often in the podcast but it's worth pointing out the song's two and a half minutes long like there's not there's there's there's, it's very 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 lean um and i think the speed of his solo and the way that harrison is playing there kind of helps to contribute to that that leanness and that that makes it sound fast that makes it sound um like it's got that kind of energetic drive to it as well yeah and and it kind of makes it feel slightly claustrophobic as well because it is such i mean even by Beatles standards it it feels such a high tempo song um you know it it doesn't let you go at any stage it, you know almost relentless you might say uh, yeah absolutely absolutely um and uh, yeah again coming back to your your favorite instrument of all time the cowbell um that's that's the other thing that it's adding like even although you know the tempo is rock steady all the way through this it it, everything is still pushing the instrumentation towards drives is that there is a lot of energy in the vocal as well we shouldn't underestimate uh the fact that the vocals are giving Mm, giving a lot of energy to it the double track vocals mccartney in the middle eight um it, it it all just contributes to pushing it further and pushing it further and pushing it further um, yeah, all that energy and momentum, it, it, it really does make a big difference when, when, when the song is this is this short. And I, I think I'm right in saying, now I'm going to double check this before I open my, my big mouth and, and get it wrong. I don't think there's a single song in this album that cracks three minutes. Um, but then there, were, there, there aren't that many Beatles songs in general that go over, say, three and a half minutes. So we'll, I'm sure we'll return to this discussion again as to just how much you can squeeze into two two minutes thirty yeah. or two minutes forty five. But you know, again, like if if you're going to take a song that's a good example of really throwing everything in and the kitchen sink and a cowbell, um, then yeah, I mean, this is you know, example one. So I suppose we ought to recognise the fact that um, we are getting lyrically more sophisticated here as well. So. Um, we're we're certainly talking about um, love in in a different way. You know, it's um, it, 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 Lennon is definitely upping his game here, even though he wrote it in a very short period of time. And you know, you can certainly, however clunky dog and log seems, um, you know, seems now in terms of a rhyme. You know, you weren't hearing too much like that. Um, you know, and and so I think that's quite interesting we've got um you know sort of a bit of a theme emerging we had money at the end of the last album and we had can't buy me love to to counter it with with, you know mccartney's point of view and now we get you know i work all day to get you money 
types of buying things. Okay, so all oh, right, we're into uh, possessions here as a um, a means of devotion. Yeah, you know, you probably what just knock that out in in the way that they they did at times. Um, rather than so you, you can't necessarily sort of look at that too deeply. But it is interesting that we are starting to get you know development on those those different topics. Again, you know, there is that broadening out. We can't just keep writing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, I quite like things like the, the rhyming of moan and alone. It is interesting, of course, that Lennon is acknowledging the fact that he has a tendency to moan. Who would have thought he would have been quite so self-aware? Well, it's, it's, it's a self-awareness that is very much appreciated, but I'm going to slightly disagree with something you said. I don't think um, Log and Dog is clunky. I think that's I think that's a nice lyric because it is taking two similes and, and popping them into a lyric in a way that, yeah, you, you didn't get that sort of thing on the last album, never mind it being a particularly common feature of lyric writing in, yep. in 63, 64. I think that's a, I think that's a clever little little couplet. I think it's great. I, I just think that, that now you if, if someone came along with a rhyme like that, you, you'd sort of question whether or not they'd been, um, you know, referring back to Noel Gallagher's rhyming dictionary. Um, yeah, that's possible. You can use simple rhyming very effectively, like Stephen Merritt of uh, Magnetic Fields does that a lot. He uses very deliberately simple rhymes in order to kind of push forward, uh, you know, the content. And, and that that can still be... Um, effective i've now got that uh, i've now got that line from julian h cope stuck in my head uh woke up in the fireplace slept like a log which is also going to annoy me for the rest of the day so thanks for that <laughs> <laughs> but uh we'll we'll just gloss over that for the time being um no i, I mean again it's not uh you know as far as the lyric goes it's not that you know there's only a limited amount but i i think this is pretty effective i don't know whether i would say it's yeah. lennon's best lyric up to this point but it it might sort of be a contender it, it definitely does show more interest in using language using simile using metaphor yeah. than than we're used to whether that is coincidental or whether that's you know as a direct result of him trying to to work on something like in his own right um i don't know but it, it i mean it's certainly the way that lennon is using language around the time that this song is being written is clearly more sophisticated than than has been the case in the past and i think that really comes through in this and it's it's quite nice even though of course you shouldn't mistake the singer with the the song um it's it's quite nice to hear him talking about going home and and you know if it was cynthia he was he was um singing about um that's great you know that's it's nice to hear him talking about that that kind of relationship in a positive way bearing in mind everything we know about um perhaps how he really felt or you know what went on to happen so that that positivity of uh you know when i'm home everything seems to be right is is, is quite a nice um a nice change in tone for him it is and it's sort of looping around to sort of what we were talking about when we were mentioning the film but it, it, it's it's a bit cheeky it's a bit cheeky chappy you know um you know that whole you know um i find the things you do will make me feel all right i'm guessing he's probably not talking about the dishes um it's 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 a little bit cheeky it's a little bit naughty but you know he's got a wink and a smile and they can yeah. get away with it um and that's 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 nice as well there's a, there's a, there's a nice little balance there um and and yeah he he gets it completely right i think it's uh, it, it's good that although this is a song that was written very very quickly it was also then subsumed into the the live act um really quickly as well so you know there are there are a fair few songs from around this time that are basically regulars for the next couple of years like you know can't buy me love and um i want to hold your hand and and money um, so that's that's pretty good to see, actually, that, that, you know, there are sort of developing them, you know, as a live act as well. So, um, you know, they clearly knew the winner for, for their audiences, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you may also argue with a certain degree of accuracy, I think it's fair to say, that that also makes it a very good sales pitch, you know, um, but yeah what's what's wrong with that uh you know it's it's a great advertisement for the movie it's a great advertisement for the soundtrack and uh yeah. and sticking it in the live set means that you know it's getting it's getting blasted out everywhere it, it will help to shift product 
fair enough. I, I didn't see that coming as a point. Um, I was saying <laughs> that they quite liked it. Yeah, well, I mean, um, it could be two things. You know, it could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, that's that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, it's definitely reasonably adaptable um, as a song. You do start to get more songs around this period that that can be covered by people, you know, in a slightly different uh, genre, whether that's, you know, the likes of um, Ella Fitzgerald or, you know, or Peggy Lee. Or, you know, there are a few where people can put a little bit more something on it, even if the, the list is still relatively simple and straightforward. Um, you know, you get, um, you know, in the early 70s, um, Otis Redding, uh, for example, as well. So there's things like that that, that kind of work. Um, but, you know, excuse me if I'm wrong, but I really think there is only one very, very famous cover of um, of this song. And and I that's don't think Peter you're wrong. Sellers. Yeah, it's definitely Peter Sellers, no question about it. Yeah. And what I find really interesting about that is it's not the only Beatles song that, that he covered. And you can find him produced by um, George Martin, of course, of course. Um, as um, doing four versions, for example, of She Loves You. There's one that's um, um, a vicar, there's an Irish one, and there's a Cockney one. But the best one is him doing his Dr. Strangelove voice. Um, and that's, you know, a little bit different. Um, so as you know, apologies, the vicar was um, um, a, a later one where he did help, where it was, you know, kind of like a um, kind of like a sermon. Um, and, you know, it's fine. They're all good as far as the jokes go, but they're, they're all a bit too long and lose their bite quickly. But the the Hard Day's Night one is him playing uh, uh, Lawrence Olivier playing Richard the Third. And it's a bit rubbish. The yes, joke goes I'm flat. I'm really, really glad really to hear quickly. you say that because that's exactly what oh. my opinion is. Like, it's Peter Sellers. Of course, I like Peter Sellers. I'm alive. But that just yeah. doesn't work. It's so hacky. And it just, yeah, no, I completely agree. I'm I'm very relieved to hear you say that because I, I was a bit worried that I might be an outlier there. But it's just not funny. It, it, it would. OK, if the far show did it, they, they would have they would have done a 30 second piece and that would be it. And then maybe later they'd have come back and done another 30 seconds. And actually, yeah, it probably would have been funnier that way. But it's it's all the weirder because it was performed on an ITV showcase in late 65 for the songs of Lennon and McCartney. It's part of a program on which the Beatles appeared that was put together by George Martin that included, you know, George Martin and his orchestra and, and a bunch of other people covering Beatles songs. It's on that. It seems, I mean, it's, it's by the way, if you, you, you do enough reading around it, you find that ITV and BBC just bent over themselves to give uh, to give the Beatles their own shows in in 64 and 65 and in, in the, I think in the 66 as well in a way that just doesn't really happen anymore it's quite incredible but then they put together these sort of slightly odd little things and the the one I referred earlier uh, to earlier um where the Beatles were rehearsing I think that was the one called around the Beatles where they also yeah. do a bit of a, a parody of a midsummer night's dream what on earth is going on? Well, the, the, I, know, think, the, the I think the answer to that question is actually quite straightforward. I think the answer to that question is variety. And that's that's the whole thing. Yeah. It's, it's variety theatre. Like that that um, that recording with um, Peter Sellers doing Richard III is... is uh, everything about it is so deeply weird. Um, but it is... It is uh, like, like variety television does still exist now, I suppose... Um, but it's also also that style of variety is long dead and gone. But that like that program, like you said it yourself, like you've got a, a, a funny sketch and you've got an orchestra and you've got um, other people doing straight covers and you've got the band themselves. It's it's variety theater. And that's that's the answer to the question. That doesn't make it good. It really, really doesn't make it good. Um, but it's 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 just straightforward old fashioned variety. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. And, and on the um, the cover front, one that I've not heard, but I've got a vague interest in hearing just how probably straightforward it is. But apparently in, in January uh, 2022, Leo Sayer did a cover of A Hard Day's Night. I think, well, I never thought I'd be saying the words Leo Sayer in 
Well, when this is released, 2023. <laughs> yeah, well, you, let's see if you remember to listen to that and come back to his next episode with, with, the, uh, with the update as to whether it's, well, I was going to say whether it's any good. I think I could probably hazard a guess there. But, but what it's like, let's say it that Yeah, way. well... Well, dear listener, if you've managed to listen to more than about one and a half episodes of this, you'll realise that the chances of me remembering to do that are fairly slim. Yeah, that that seems fair. I think we, I mean, it sort of sounds like we're, I mean, we're quite impressed by how far we've got with this, very mind how little we actually talked about the song itself. Um, <laughs> it's okay. You know, it, it's worth worth drawing on um, um, Tony Barrow's um, sleeve notes for this. Um uh, from the album, you've, you've got some 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 little vignettes about each song, and yet all he manages to really say about this is that the number features John's double track voice producing a duet effect, uh, and then he says it has a brisk, compelling theme, which crops up um, in orchestral form elsewhere during the film as part of recording manager George Martin's instrumental soundtrack score. That's it, which I, I think kind of sums it up in respect because it's just like you know it's good but it's not deep well that's an excellent segue into giving it a score since we're summing everything up so what do you fancy giving a hard days and night seven seven you know just it's just, just out with it it's done it's like the song itself just 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 put the score out there and and don't think about it just get it done seven Okay, um, I'm also going to give it a seven. And I'm going to do that for precisely the same reason, so I have nothing else to add. Good. Lovely. Okay. Well, <laughs> since Excellent. I have nothing else to add. As we approach the L mark, I too have nothing left to add. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's uh, let's call it there then, shall we? Uh, you can contact us by email. We are Beatlesstuffology at gmail.com. Uh, we are on Twitter at Beatles underscore apology. And you can find my blog at www.jgmacquarie.scot. Also check out my other podcast, Talking Trek to You, where a new band and expert, which is me, go through the original Star Trek episode by episode. Please like, rate and review us on whatever podcast you're using so that more people can find this show. Next episode, we trot merrily along through the album and we reach a song which very much should have been your um, your note for whether to uh, do this podcast or not. I should have known better. But until then, keep listening. <laughs>